You take the function e raised to minus x square and plot it. It forms a beautiful, symmetric, bell-shaped curve centered at zero. Now you try to find the area under the entire curve, or this entire shaded region. We can do so by integrating this function from negative infinity to positive infinity. So far, so good. But then, out of nowhere, the answer turns out to be the square root of pi. Wait, what? Where did that come from? There are no circles here, no diameters or radii. It's just a weird exponential curve. So seriously, what is pi even doing here? Let us solve this integral to find out. I'll try to find a standard formula, something neat like the ones we use for polynomials or trigonometric functions, or maybe a substitution trick or an integration by parts. But it turns out that nothing really works. This function just refuses to play nice. So what to do now? We're forced to bring in a completely different approach. And you know what? That's when pi will mysteriously show up in the integral. Let us call this integral as i. Now we can also rewrite this i as integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, e raised to minus y square times dy, because the variable name doesn't actually matter here. It's just a placeholder. So whether we call it x or y or t or q, it doesn't matter. The integral stays the same. Now let us multiply this integral with this integral to get i times i or i squared as this. Now here comes the first magic. This definite integral in y is just the area under this curve, and in the end, it is going to spit out some constant value. So we can place it inside this definite integral in x and it will feel like we are just doing some integral of k times e raised to minus x square, where k is just a constant. Now this is an integral in terms of the variable y, and this is a function in terms of x. So we can sneakily put this function inside this integral because we can move constants in and out of an integral, as long as they don't involve the variable you're integrating over. But you might say, hey, where is the constant? This is not a constant. It is a function in terms of x. You are right. But in our case, since the inner integral is with respect to y, any expression that does not depend on y is treated as a constant during that part of the process. So this function in x acts as a constant when we are integrating this part having variable y. So put this e raised to minus x square inside this inner integral. Multiplying both of them will give us e raised to minus x squared minus y squared, or e raised to minus x squared plus y squared. Wow, this is a double integral. See how cleverly we turned a one-dimensional integral into this two-dimensional version. But you will be like, why are you so happy? You literally made it more complicated. We started with one integral, simple, clean, and now we have this giant looking double integral floating over two variables. Obviously, that looks worse, not better. But hold on, stay with me, because here's the twist. This is where things start getting really satisfying. That expression x squared plus y squared should ring a bell. Doesn't it remind you of something? Think distance from the origin in a circle, and boom! If we have a circle of radius r centered at origin, then any point on that circle satisfies the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared. All credits to our good old friend Pythagoras for this. So, now can you see how this integral is somewhat related to pi? because we will now bring circles into the picture. By the way, what does this double integral even mean? Well, think of it like this. Instead of just calculating the area under this curve, like we did in the one-dimensional case, now we're calculating the volume under the surface e raised to minus x squared plus y squared, which will look like this. 
Now, if x and y are zero, we get this circle at the top where r is zero. For some value of x and y, we get this circle whose radius is some r. And when x and y are infinite, we get this circle whose radius is infinite. So r goes from zero to infinite. Now here comes the second magic. You can see that we can represent this shape as a collection of thin little hollow cylinders or cylindrical shells under this surface like this. So when we add up all those little cylinder volumes across the whole plane, we get the total volume under the surface, exactly what the double integral is trying to calculate. To do that, focus on this one cylindrical shell whose radius is this r, then this is the height h, which will be e raised to minus x squared plus y squared. As you can see that any point on this graph at this radius r has a value of this function. So we can also write h as e raised to minus r squared because of this circle equation. And then its thickness will be this little part, which will be dr, because walls of tube is supposed to be infinitesimally thin. So what will be its volume? It will be the area of this cylindrical shell times its thickness. We can imagine it as a rolled paper. If you cut the paper like this, it will open up to make a rectangle whose length will be equal to 2 times pi times r, that is the circumference of the circular ring, and the height will be e raised to minus r squared. So the area of that rectangle is just 2 times pi times r times e raised to minus r squared. And when we multiply that by the small thickness dr, we get the volume of that thin cylindrical shell. Now just integrate it from r equals zero to infinity. This is super easy. Take out pi since it's constant. Now let u equal r squared. So if r is zero, then u is zero. And if r is infinity, u will also be infinity. Also, du will be 2r times dr. Now rewrite the integral using u. This 2r times dr will become du, and this will be e raised to minus u. Integral e raised to minus u is minus of e raised to minus u, and put here 0 and here infinity. Remove the minus sign, and it will be 0 here and infinity here. So we get e raised to minus 0 minus e raised to minus infinity. This is 1, and this is 1 over e to the infinity, which is 1 over infinity or 0. So this is 1, and multiplied by pi gives this as pi. So we have i squared equals pi, and thus we get i as square root of pi, and that's it. My mind is doing somersaults right now. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, you can support my channel by joining our community and becoming a member. So good!